How's everybody this morning? Fine. We're going to do like we've been doing, sing a few songs. If I had to stop during the song, it's because this page is blown over. I tried to find a way to keep it from blowing off during the preacher's sermon, but it might get flipped while I'm doing this. So just sing along, please, if you know it. If you don't, make something up. around you please blow the horn at him stick your head out the window say hello, hello. I'm gonna try to turn in a different way shall see and I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me to the promised land what a day glorious day that will be there'll be no sorrow there no more birth sickness, no pain, no more parting over there, and forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be
Well, good morning. Good morning. It seems we have a number of people at the beach today. We want to tell you that we've uh, got the FM transmitter, and it works, but there's a buzz in it that's pretty terrible. So Bill wants to play with some other cables. But when we get it, and hopefully next week we'll be able to do it, if you're gonna open your windows and sit out, we're gonna ask you to come to the front. And if you're gonna run your car and listen on the radio, we're gonna ask you to move to the back. If you think about it, you'd hate to be sitting right behind somebody who's running their car and pumping out their exhaust on you while you're trying to worship. So if you're gonna run your car, move a little bit back so that you're not, so you're with the other cars that are running theirs. In, those of you who enjoy seeing me not wear a tie, you better get used to it. Better get all you can now because I promise you, as soon as I can, that coat and tie is going back on. I still feel like the Lord's going to throw a lightning bolt at me. Maybe a preacher ought to be that way. Maybe we ought to be a, a little bit respectful when we uh, get up here. I was really impressed with some uh, with a preacher from India one time. He... Uh, got up into our pulpit and before he did he took his shoes off and he said in India Christian pastors take their shoes off when they get into the podium because that's like holy ground like Moses on the in front of the burning bush and so in India the preachers preach barefoot just an interesting little tradition preacher I do want to say if you're worried about getting hit by a lightning bolt I appreciate that you wait till I get off of that podium for you Come <laughs> I still want to talk about worshiping God. So if you would, let's turn in our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke chapter 22. And we're going to look at verses 39 through 46. And for a short moment, we're going to flip a chapter over and look at 23, verse 46. But right now, Luke 22, and we're going to read 39 through 42 before we go to the Lord in prayer. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. 
Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Let's pray together silently at first. Heavenly Father, we're here for different reasons. Some are here seeking comfort. Some seek answers. But all of us come to worship you, to praise your name, <laughs> to declare your glories and your greatness. Thank you for the time we've spent outside worshiping in your glory. The breeze is wonderful. The morning is great. <coughs> Help us to focus on you, your will for our life, our place in your kingdom. We trust our Lord when he says that if we seek your kingdom and its righteousness, that all our other concerns will be answered for us. To that end, Lord, teach us your word, not that we simply be educated or edified or even entertained, but that we be taught to be like Jesus. For it's in his name we pray and by his authority. Amen. <clears throat> Last week we talked about the need to worship God. Yes, it's interesting for the preacher to preach on issues that directly affect us, but we're here to worship God. And quite frankly, if you can't do it out here, you might not ever do it. I heard a preacher say one time, I'm sorry, I'm watching a, hawk, watching a hawk fly over. I heard a preacher say one time, he was talking about the gospel, and he said, if that doesn't get your fire going, your wood's wet. <laughs> well, if you can't praise the Lord right now, talk to me because you need prayer. But to worship God, we have to understand the price he paid for us. We can understand God's love by looking at his sacrifice of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. And I said that there are wonderful lessons that we can gain from, from knowing God's love. By knowing his love, we learn to trust his love. By trusting his love, we learn to follow his love. And by following his love, we learn to copy his love. Jesus says that love is the motivating factor for all Christians. But it's our love for God. We get lost sometimes. We think we're going to love the church or love the preacher or love other people. And that's wonderful and it's Christ-like. But it all begins with our love of God. And if we don't love him, the love we have for these other things is a false love. Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That's the first and greatest commandment. That is the entire Bible encapsulated. Today, I want us to consider the price that we have to pay. You see, love's not free. While love is given freely, love always has a cost. If you've ever had a baby, you understand that. You cannot have a child without paying a high cost. Now, there's no parent who would say they begrudge that money spent or that time spent or that energy spent. There's no parent I've ever heard who says, I want the time back in sleep that I missed while walking my baby. 
but we understand that love is expensive. It's expensive because the one we love is more precious than anything else. So if I'm going to love God, I have to value him above the world. And that will cost me if I do it. We seem to forget sometimes that what God takes and puts in us, he does in times of turmoil. We, the Chinese have a blessing. They say, may you live in uninteresting times. And if you think about it, that's a pretty interesting blessing. Because interesting times cause trouble. Amen? Amen. You can't watch TV and realize that we do not live in uninteresting times. But this is when God acts. This is when God takes us and makes us like Jesus. And that the only way to go to heaven is the way of the garden, the cross, and the grave. We want a religion where we give our life to Jesus and things just gradually get better. I've talked to a lot of men, never a woman, but I've talked to a lot of men who are lost and they'll come to church and hope that if they just sit in church long enough, a little bit of it will rub off on them and they'll get better and better until finally they're good enough. And I have to tell them woefully that's not the way it works. We need the garden, we need the cross, and we need the grave. Not just from Jesus, but for us. You and I have to have our own garden experience where we get down on our knees and say, Lord, I don't want this. We each need our own cross. Jesus said, if anybody would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. And then we have to be willing to die. What is baptism after all? You know, we all get the, the first part. Baptism means two things. And we all get the first one, that it's immersion in the Holy Spirit. That as we're surrounded by the water, we're surrounded by the Holy Spirit. But do you understand the second meaning of baptism? That we are laid in the grave? That we are dead to self? Paul says... Reckon the members of your body as dead to sin. For me to become a Christian, I have to die. And a new creature has to be born. Now that's painful. Anyone who tells you it's easy is lying to you. The garden, the cross, and the grave. So I'd like for us to look this morning at the cost of loving God. You know, when I go to the store and I look at a product, the salesman's trying to talk me into it. If he won't tell me the price, I know I better get out of there. We all want to know the cost. Sometimes we preachers are guilty of telling you the benefits of salvation but not talking about the cost. First of all, love demands the garden. Verse 39 says, Coming out, he, Jesus, went to the Mount of Olives. As he was accustomed, it was his normal way of life to pray on a regular basis. A lot of us, our problem is we don't pray. Why do we avoid prayer? Well, if I pray, I might hear God. And if I hear God, he might tell me to do something and I don't want to do anything. It's the same reason we don't read our Bibles. I might read something in there that tells me to do something I don't want to do. He went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. This is a small mountain near Jerusalem, a part of the, the chain of mountains that 
Jerusalem sat upon. Now this is the Garden of Gethsemane. Mount of Olives, we get that, Mountain of Olives. Gethsemane is Hebrew for an olive press. You see, they take olives and we eat olives. But back then, the number one by far way of finding oil to burn in your lamps, to use in perfumes or medical treatments was olive oil. They would press the olive. If you had olive trees, you were oil rich. They would take those and press them and squeeze the oil out of them. You see, Jesus went there to be squeezed himself. We think of prayer as a nice, peaceful time. Jesus went there in prayer to be squeezed. For God to take him in his hand and squeeze. And you and I have to be willing to do the same. We understand this. I mentioned babies earlier. And I tell new parents or prospective parents, if you'll just give up on the hope of sleeping for the first few weeks, you won't be disappointed because that baby's not going to let you sleep. But when it comes to prayer, for some reason, the idea that if I meet God, he's going to tell me something scares us. But Jesus went there to get squeezed. Are you willing to get on your knees and pray and say, Lord, if you want to wring me out like a washcloth, you do it. Squeeze the sin out of me. Squeeze my fears and my doubts out of me so that I can be ready to be used in your hand. Jesus is going to the cross, but before the cross, he goes to prayer. Because the first thing God does to you and me before he puts us to work is he squeezes us. I was talking about Jesus, but now let's talk about you and me. He squeezes us. Now, we live in an age where people don't like to be insulted. I remember I preached up in the mountains, and mountain people are a little bit different. I would have old folks tell me, Preacher, you did a good job this week. You stepped on my toes hard. Nowadays, a preacher is supposed to talk about nice, fluffy things, bright and easy. But sometimes we need to be squeezed, especially right before God does something. Verse 40 says, And when Jesus came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now, the disciples thought they were just following along. They thought Jesus was doing everything. And he said, boys, the big deal here is not me, but y'all. I want y'all to pray that you won't, be, you won't enter into temptation. They didn't know it, but they were going to be squeezed. Peter was squeezed so hard he ran from the Lord, remember? When Jesus was arrested, Peter denied Jesus three times. After Jesus had warned him that he was going to do it, and he said, Lord, you're crazy, I never would. That's how hard the great disciple Peter was squeezed. All of them were squeezed, though. God has something in mind for you. And it is hard. Do we understand when we say the idea of taking up our cross, that a cross is always painful and a cross is always deadly? God wants something out of you and me that is painful and deadly. Maybe he wants you to be a Sunday school teacher. And if you do, you lose a part of yourself. I remember being so thrilled at this for our fourth grade Sunday school class for boys at our, at our last church. Now, that wasn't normal for that church, but this was a bad group of boys. So we created a class just for them. And she fell in love with those boys. She had boys of her own. And she and I would pray for those boys. 
She was worried about their families, worried about the way they were being raised. She gave up a large part of her life to love five boys who were not her own. When God calls you to be to work for Him, He calls you into death, into sacrifice. A lot of deacons will say, why can't, and our deacons are wonderful, but you'll hear a lot of deacons in other churches who'll say, why can't I get the respect that those old deacons got? And I've had to tell them, tell deacons on other occasions, well, you remember the house fire 30 years ago? They were there putting it out. You remember when the baby died and they were sitting with the family crying? Where have you been? We get squeezed or we don't get used. And every good servant of God has been wrung out. But our prayer must be to leave temptation. Jesus had one thing to say to the disciples. They're about to be tempted. They're about to go into, excuse me, they're about to be um, squeezed. And he says, pray that you not enter into temptation. Our problem is not that temptation reaches out and grabs us. I've heard a lot of people say that. But that's not true. Our problem is temptation comes and we sidle over beside it. And we hang around with it for a while. Then we rub shoulders with it. Then we put our arm around it. And then we engage in sin. Jesus told his disciples, pray that you not enter into temptation. We need to just leave it. Whatever sins are keeping you from God, you need to just walk away from it. Not enter into it. And as he was withdrawn, verse 41, from them, about a stone's throw, they were actually lower on the mountain. He went up higher. He knelt down and he prayed. And this is the prayer of faith, the prayer we need. He had just told them to pray. Now he's going to show them how to pray. Saying, Father, if it is your will, let this cup, take this cup away from me. You know, back then, a form of capital punishment was to make someone drink poison. The famous philosopher Socrates was forced to drink hemlock. You would, they didn't have an electric chair. They didn't have electricity. So they would execute people by making them drink a cup of poison. Usually poison mixed with some kind of sedative so they'd just go to sleep and never wake up. So when Jesus says, don't let me drink this cup, take it away from me, he's saying, don't make me face death. I don't want to be executed. I don't want to die on the cross. Faith is honest. We have a right to tell God, I don't like this. I don't want this. I don't want to give up all my time as a Sunday school teacher. I don't want to sit in other people's houses if I'm a deacon I don't want to have to spend the time and study and work. We have a right to tell God that. We have a right to say, I don't want to grow old. You know, God does a lot of squeezing of us through old age. I talked to a fellow one time, he was a preacher up in the mountains, and he, and he said, you know, when I was a boy, I, was, I had ADD, ADHD, whatever you want to call it. I said, so you grew out of it, right? He said, no, I just got so old and tired, I don't have energy for it anymore. God squeezes us through old age. God squeezes us through disease and infirmity. I'll never forget my pastor when I was a boy, having to have back surgery. And he laid on his back for six weeks. And he told the church, I had forgotten to be a Christian. I was so busy being a pastor, I had forgotten to take care of my own personal devotional life. And he said, God had to lay me on my back to make me look up to heaven. We have a right to say, I don't like this. Then Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Faith is honest, but faith is also obedient. 
You can tell God you don't like it. You don't want it. But then we have to go through it. Because if that's what God wants, then that's what we need. Then, verse 43 says, an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. The angel didn't come until Jesus was obedient. We tell God we don't like it, but then we tell him, but we'll do it. Whatever it is. You know, for some people, what's too hard is to get up and go to church. If I had a nickel for every time somebody told me, Preacher, I want to come to church, but it's just too hard to get up on Sunday morning. I would be, well, I could buy a small car. I had a family one time, two churches ago. They said, Preacher, every week we want to come to church, and we just cannot wake up on Sunday morning. The devil just gets a hold of us, and we can't wake up on Sunday morning. Well, I I kind of smelled a rat, and I said, well, tell me what you do on Saturday. They said, well, we have a family tradition. We go out to the, uh, the uh, Darlington uh, racetrack every Saturday night. I said, what time do you get home? Well, we don't get home to 2.30 or 3. Get the kids in bed about 3.30. I said, you think that might be why you can't get up on Sunday morning? Faith is honest, faith is obedient, and faith is rewarded. When I say, Lord, I will do your will, then we're blessed. We're blessed because God blesses us through, through the trouble. And if we walk away from it, we can't be blessed. Well, if love demands the garden, love demands the cross. I told you we we're going to look at uh, chapter 23, verse 46. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he's on the cross here. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. God squeezes us until we have nothing else but him. The reason for his squeezing then is to get rid of our sin, get rid of our distractions, get rid of our money, get rid of our health, get rid of all the good things we want. The Apostle Paul, remember, he took away his eyesight. Until we have nothing left but God, and we find out that when we have him, we have everything. You can't have God while you're holding on to other things. You can't trust him while you're trusting other things. When I was, before I went to seminary, I spent six months trying to earn enough money to go to seminary. And I was talking to my associate, our, our associate pastor at our church about it. And he said, would you quit fixing to get ready and just go? When we have nothing left but God, then we have faith. Verse 44 said, him, being in agony, Jesus cried more, more earnestly, and he prayed more earnestly. We pray until times get hard, and then we go look for a foxhole to jump, jump into. Jesus prayed before the cross, and when it got hard, he prayed even harder. Then he sweat, his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. About 30 years ago, excuse me, about 40 years ago, I had a, a heart doctor explain to me that under extreme, extremely high blood pressure, the capillaries, the little bitty blood vessels, can burst. And when they burst, they come out through your sweat glands, your sweat pores, and you sweat drops of blood. Jesus prayed so hard, the burden was so great. Remember what he was doing. He was going to the cross 
which yes meant death and it meant torture ahead of time but it also meant the pangs of hell we're told in Deuteronomy cursed is he who hangs on a tree Jesus died cursed for our sins the Bible says God made him who knew, who knew no sin to become sin for our sake Paul says that Jesus ascended what does that mean but also that he descended and went into hell Jesus went to hell for three days for my sins. Now, I don't know how long hell feels like or three days in hell feels like, but I'm sure I don't want to know. But Jesus, God Almighty, went to hell for three days for my sins. And he didn't want that. And the stress of that caused great problems he was determined to obey but his own body was rebelling against him there is no faith without Jesus we cannot have faith without aiming it at God you know a lot of times fighting a battle here a lot of times people make the mistake of having faith in faith if I just believed harder, I could have it. If I just tried harder, it would work. You can't have faith in nothing. And you can't have faith in the wrong thing. Faith is not faith unless it's in God through Jesus Christ. If you're depending, and I, in Isaiah we're, said, we're told some people trust in chariots. Some, tr some trust in armies, but we trust in the Lord. Did I step out of the camera, Connor? <sighs> you see, faith in faith is worthless. Let me show you a little bit about that. Verse 45, then Jesus rose up from prayer and had come, when he did, he came to his disciples and he found them sleeping from sorrow. You understand that, sleeping from sorrow. When I was a boy, I thought that meant they were lazy. They had literally cried themselves to sleep. Have you ever done that? God in his mercy has created a hormone that our bodies release when we cry that makes us sleepy. Sometimes the best thing you can do when you're grieving is just go to bed. And they had cried themselves to sleep, praying for Jesus, being themselves squeezed. You see, they had sorrow because while they trusted in Jesus, they had no faith in what God was about to do. They were grieving because they thought, I'm, we're going to lose Jesus. He's going to die. We grieve foolishly when we forget about God. Do you believe God is at work? Do you believe God is at work in all the events around us? Do you believe that God is at work even in evil people to accomplish His will? Instead of being sorrowful, we need to be curious asking ourselves what is God up to what is he doing through this because I tell you whatever big thing is going on in this world God is bending it for his glory and using it for his purposes we have to pray until we can see the hand of God we pray for the wrong thing we pray for answers we don't need the answers. We're not the answer giver. We need to pray for what God is up to. Lord, show me what you're doing in my disease. Show me what you're doing with my bad heart. Show me what you're doing in my poverty. Show me what you're doing in my growing old. Show me what you're doing in my misery. Show me what you're doing in the attacks that other people are levying upon me. Show me your hand at work. 
if the disciples had prayed that, they would have seen Jesus going to the cross to save them from their sins. Then he said to them, why do you sleep? And he repeated, rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. Why do we sleep? Why do we sleep? Why do God's people go through the world with blinders on, not looking at what's going on around? The disciples were broken because of sorrow. And all they had to do was find the hand of God. Well, if love demands the garden, if love demands the cross, finally love demands the grave. I know you'd like for me to tell you that when we go to the cross, we're going to be blessed and we're going to live wonderfully. And the Bible says we will go to the cross and we will die. Sunday school teacher, you will die in your sacrifice. You'll give up large parts of yourself. That Saturday night, you wanted to spend something else, doing something else, you'll be, you'll be studying instead. But I can tell you, having given up my life for Jesus Christ, that everything he's asked me to do has blessed me. I have had, I have had death at every turn. I met my wife going on a mission trip to Chicago. Every blessing in my life has come by giving up everything I have. But God wants more. He wants us to die. One of the saddest things for me is when I see a deacon who says, well, I'm going to take a break. I've been working hard in church, and I'm going to take a break. Because I know pretty soon they'll be out the door. We weren't made to take a break. Taking a break from Jesus is like taking a break from breathing. It won't work out. We are called, and we have to stay faithful to that call. When you're done trying to fix yourself, when you're done trying to solve your own problems, when you're done trying to figure out what's wrong, lay your life in God's hands. It'll hurt. You'll be squeezed You'll be nailed upon a cross and you will die. But when you're through, you will see the face of Jesus. How can I be a Christian and not follow Jesus? He was squeezed, he went to the cross, and he went to the grave. And praise God for all that. We must do the same. Gethsemane is an example, and it is a formula for the way that God uses his people. He doesn't build us up and let us get richer and stronger and better and better. He squeezes everything out of us until there's nothing left but him. He does that for all of those who are willing to to pay the price for servitude. Will you pay that price? Will you say, Lord, use me. I know it'll hurt. And I know I'm going to complain. I'm not promising that I'm not going to whine. But I will do my best to obey even while I whine. And I will follow Jesus to the cross to the grave. As always, we, as, well not as always, but as, as lately, we can't have an altar call. I guess I could be like a drive up, I could just stand up here on the side and you could drive by one at a time, but we really can't do that. But if you feel the need to give your heart to Jesus, please call me. You know my phone number, 
I'm not going to put it on YouTube and Facebook, but you know my phone number. You can message us on Facebook. You can message us on YouTube. If God has spoken to you and you need to respond, please call on me. Thank you.